Thank you for joining us for our online summit on EdTech leadership and innovation. It was a very lively conversation with a lot of problems, solutions, challenges that we talked about in different ways. My name is Kevin Bushweller. I'm an assistant managing editor of Education Week. I oversee our coverage of educational technology and our annual Technology Counts report. And I have with me two education writers, Michelle Davis and also Sarah Schwartz. And we're going to continue this conversation now about the rooms that we hosted and the types of uh, problems, solutions, and challenges that people were talking about in those rooms. And we're going to start with the room that I hosted, why technology is not transforming teaching. That's a big issue these days. We've done a number of presentations about it at various conferences, and they've generated big crowds and lots of questions. And that was also the case today in this discussion. So we're just going to get started. And Michelle actually has a bunch of questions for me about what happened in that room. And so go ahead, Michelle. Well, I think one of the things, Kevin, is that the promise of technology is that it will transform teaching and learning. So why is that not happening? I think one of the things that came up in the course of the conversation and also in a lot of the research we've done on this issue over the past few years is that teachers tend to take technology and simply layer it on top of their current teaching practices, which often are very traditional teaching practice, practices, lecturing and such but they don't use it to transform their teaching in ways where students are learning in much different formats, uh, much more individualized instruction, um, and, and other you know, ways that it's very different from the typical teacher at the front of the, front of the room. I think one of the things that came up a lot in my booth was that professional development is a critical element when you're implementing um, some kind of technology initiative. And I think uh, a lot of times that PD is not implemented in a way that really helps teachers and educators understand how to use these things in an innovative way in their classrooms. So, oh, go ahead, Sarah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think a lot of times that um, uh, a technology coach can sort of be a critical friend in that way. Um, so we had in um, my chat room um, about uh, teaching with technology, um, there was a coach who said that she was frustrated um, because one of the teachers that she works with was um, using, uh, trying to differentiate using Google Classroom. And she had put a worksheet into Google Classroom that all of the students were doing at the same time. And this coach was saying, well, all of the students are sort of working uh, you know, at their own pace on this worksheet, but it's the same worksheet for every kid. So how can we sort of move past that? Um, and that was a, a struggle that kept coming up in, in the chat room that I was in. And it was interesting too, we were talking uh, during the online summit that there's this tendency to offer this quote, sit and get PD, where you just come in into a room and they throw a lot of information at, at you and then they send you out with the technology and say, good luck. And it's surprising how many districts still do that. Michelle's, Michelle's husband is a teacher and he's seen it. Um, and you can speak to that a little bit too. Yeah, I, I think um, everyone kind of realizes now that it's not particularly effective, but I think it still goes on on a regular basis. And just to draw on what went on in the discussion that I had today, um, which was about the principles and the role that they play in these types of initiatives, I think the principle often sets the tone for a lot of either the PD or using technology that it's okay to take risks. It's okay for something to not work perfectly the first time. I think that the principle really sets the tone and the culture around technology in schools. Interesting. And the other thing is that we've also seen some uh, research studies and some reporting we've done about usage rates. So the usage rates of ed tech products are, tend to be very low. And it get, that gets at some of these things we're talking about now. If you don't provide the professional development, the training that's going to allow these teachers to use this technology in smart ways, they're simply not going to use it. And, and there needs to be more um, thought and more strategies for figuring out how to improve those usage rates. 
I actually just recently wrote a story that found that 67% of software licenses were going unused in school districts across the country. Um, districts are losing millions of dollars. And uh, the guest that I had in my chat today, Sarah Guerrero, who's a principal at a middle school, um, she said one of the biggest issues is sign-in, just some basic things, that mm -hmm. sign-in is difficult and teachers are just not going to do it if they can't sign in easily. I'm sure you heard about that yeah. in Yeah, so we had um, a lot of people asking questions uh, that all sort of boiled down to, how do I get my teachers to use the tools that I've already bought? And uh, my guest, Robin Williams, who is a tech coach um, in Georgia, at a school in Georgia, she said, you're asking the wrong question. You should be asking, what do my teachers need? And how how can I solve that problem with a tech tool? Because if you're trying to get them to use something that you think they need, that might not be working for them. And I think one of the most egregious examples of that was several years ago when the Los Angeles schools purchased all those iPads and just plopped them into classrooms and told the teachers, all right, now figure out how to use them to improve learning. And it, and it turned into a financial mess and, and more importantly, a learning mess. The kids learned nothing, the iPads didn't get used well, and they had to shift and make all kinds of changes. Have you seen that in some of your reporting too, Michelle? Uh, definitely, I mean, I think we a lot of it goes back to professional development, but it also goes to communication. I think one of the hallmarks of a, an entre entrepreneurial principal or a school leader or a district leader is effective communication and communicating with different groups and stakeholders um, parents, teachers, students themselves. So I want to pivot a little bit here to principals. Uh, the title of your room was Why Principals Are the Lynchpins for EdTech Success. Why are they the lynchpins? I think anyone who's been in a school or who's worked in a school knows that the principal sets the tone of the school and has a huge uh, amount to contribute to the school culture. So if you're setting a tone and setting a culture that it's okay to experiment, that it's okay when something doesn't work perfectly, um, that you're embracing um, people who take risks, um, that's going to go a long way towards uh, an effective implementation of technology. Interesting. So we, last year, we, our Technology Counts report, actually did a survey of principles that revealed some really interesting things. Uh, one was that Although they embrace the idea of personalized learning, which you know has a lot of digital tools that are used as a part of it, they also had some significant concerns about it. For instance, that students would be spending too much time learning alone um, and, and other concerns. Have you heard some of those concerns among teachers too? Yeah, um, so uh, a lot of teachers um, are actually uh, worried about the way that parents are talking to them about personalized learning. That was something that came up a lot in um, in my chat room. Uh, they were saying, how can I get parents to sort of understand what we're doing here, that we're not trying to um, just put a kid in front of a computer and let them go, but that we're trying to use this to support what our teachers are doing, which is um, instructing in some ways in the way that they always have been. Um, and so a lot of the response to that was, you need to bring parents in early and you need to respond to their questions not sort of talk at them and uh, and and expect them to, to accept what you're saying okay. I think that's where that effective communication yeah. piece comes in as well yeah and just to piggyback on that I thought it was really interesting in our, our technology counts report last year 64% um, of principals said that students were getting just the right amount of screen time at school, but 95% they were said they were having too much outside of school. So mm -hmm. it's interesting. They feel like the balance is okay in schools, but outside it's out of whack. Right. I also um, I think principals have sort of a, a high level picture that maybe individual teachers don't. Um, one principal in our chat room said um, about communicating with parents, she said, yeah, some teachers at our school use these digital communication tools to communicate with parents and that works very well. But overall, when you look across all of our classrooms, print is still king. Sending home a flyer is still the, the number one way that we reach most of our parents. And that's a sort of a high level um, understanding that you would only have if you are um, looking across the building. So we had some interesting conversations uh, before we start, uh, started the, this conversation. And one was, you know, what, 
What are what are some of the entrepreneurial approaches that principals are using? Because you saw some of that in your room, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, my principal that I had in my room, Sarah Guerrero, she actually has an MBA. Um, and she's used a lot of the things that she's learned um, in her MBA program uh, around uh, her ed tech initiatives in her schools. And one of them is the idea of iteration, that maybe the first time um, you put something in place, it doesn't work right, quite right, and you build on it, and you refine it, and you keep going. You don't throw it out with the bathwater and say, hey, forget it. Um, another thing that she talked a lot about is the idea of taking small steps first and getting people on board. Um, it's a technique that I think businesses use uh, very well. Um, you know, getting teachers and principal and, and uh, parents um, involved and to back a program in a small scale before you widen it to the whole building. So I, men I mentioned usage rates um, uh, earlier. Have, have you seen that with teachers too? They just get frustrated with a certain type of technology and say, forget it, I'm just doing it the way I used to do it. Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to think about what was um, w things related to that in, in the room that I was in. And I think um, a lot of that has to do with uh, maybe not abandoning a tool entirely, but using it for a slightly different purpose than maybe what it was intended for. Um, so one of uh, the two guests in, in my room, um, Sophia Garcia Smith, who is a teacher in a suburb outside of Chicago, um, she was saying she tries to keep it really, really simple with tech tools that maybe otherwise have a lot of bells and whistles. Um, and maybe they were introduced into her classroom to use those bells and whistles, but she sort of likes to strip that down and just use them for their basic purpose. So for example, um, she was saying that she uses a recording device sometimes so that she doesn't have to do um, individual reading conferences with every single single kid in her class uh, so that in, instead of listening to a, a child read in person, um, that child can read and record themselves and then she can listen to that recording to check for fluency and sort of other markers of, of their performance. Um, and that's a really, really simple thing, just like a recording device. Um, but that's the level that a lot of teachers are working on. They're not looking for a lot of those bells and whistles often. Okay, well that's all the time we have. I want to thank you again for joining us. It was a very lively conversation. Conversation. I would highly encourage you to check out our Technology Counts report, which is online. It addresses a lot of these issues that we talked about today. It also includes a nationally representative survey. And feel free to reach out to us if you have ideas about you know, why, te why technology does not transform teaching and the steps that uh, schools can take to improve that. Thank you for joining us for our online summit on EdTech Leadership and Innovation. 
I have staff education staff writer Ben Harold and Associate Education Week associate editor Sean Cavanaugh with us today. He's also the uh, managing editor of Ed Week Market Brief. And we're going to talk about some ed tech leadership issues, which have evolved significantly over the past few years. And I'm going to start with you, Ben. Uh, I, you know, I'd like to ask you, can you talk about the tension between cybersecurity and teachers wanting the freedom to try new tools, to innovate, uh, and to experiment, and also be able to fail and not worry about it? One thing that we've really seen, Kevin, <coughs> excuse me, one th <coughs> Excuse me. One thing that we've really seen is that um, chief technology officers in school districts are really on the front lines of this challenge. So they're responsible increasingly for both the security issues, making sure that all the data that's being collected by uh, the technology that they use is safe and protected and not vulnerable to hackers or to misuse by companies or others, but also at the same time trying to make sure the technology is being used uh, effectively in the classroom for instruction and in creative new ways. And one of the ways this tension kind of comes up is we'll see that teachers often want to try new tools. They hear about a new app, they hear about a new software program, and they want to go out and try it. Um, but for technology officers, that often presents a challenge because sometimes those tools uh, collect and use data in ways that aren't approved or they can have um, security challenges that, that come up as well. So many districts are trying to implement processes by which teachers kind of have to go through to get approval for that. But then there's often pushback from that in the classroom saying, hey, that's cumbersome, it takes too long, why can't I just try this? So this tension between being able to experiment, being able to innovate, but also doing it safely is something that we're really seeing schools wrestling with particularly chief technology officers right now. Okay, and now we, we have published a series of online only special reports for ed tech leaders. Mm -hmm. and, and part of that was reporting on some surveys that COSIN has done. Mm -hmm. And could tell me, was, it, was cybersecurity the number one priority for ed tech leaders this year? Tell me a little bit about that. It, it's the biggest challenge that they identify right now, and that's new. Historically, it's been other things around budgeting, around things like um, using data for instruction and trying to get different data systems talking to each other. But uh, just in the last year or two, um, K-12 technology leaders have really said cybersecurity is the big challenge. And we see that in headlines. All across the country, school districts are dealing with hacks, phishing attacks where teachers are losing their you know, tax information, W-2 information. We've seen school districts um, hacked uh, and lose construction funds and other public dollars running into the millions of dollars, um, as well as just a loss of trust. Uh, when there's a breach or a hack and people's information is compromised, uh, there can be questions about, hey, why are we using all this technology? Why are we collecting all this data? Can we trust you to do that safely? So all of those concerns, I think, are front of mind for K-12 tech leaders right now. And, that, and is that what you were hearing in the room, too? Absolutely. We heard a lot of uh, technology leaders and instructional technology leaders really wrestling with you know, how to be smart up front, how to do good prevention, what's the kind of low-hanging fruit you can do to try and fend off some of these attacks, and then also how do you respond if and when they do happen to make sure that you don't lose that trust and that you get on top of the situation quickly. Okay, thanks. Sean, one of the things that Edweek Market Brief has covered quite a bit recently is our usage rates of ed tech products. And, you know, how often does it occur that a district will use only a portion of an ed tech product and, and leave the rest basically unused? And, and why, is, why is that a problem for schools and companies? Uh, it's a big problem, and we hear of it occurring all the time. Uh, w one of the main reasons it occurs is that a lot of these ed tech tools are, quite frankly, pretty complex for teachers. You may have teachers with... Uh, varying levels of experience using technology. Um, so professional development is offered um, in terms of using a new ed tech tool, and um, only 10 or 15% of the tool ends up getting used. Teachers stick with what they're familiar with in terms of um, the features of that product uh, that they want, and the rest gets put aside. Uh, the guests in my booth talked about solutions to that problem, some of which were things like um, trying to have teachers coach teachers so that um, you're having a peer explain to you, well, this is a feature of, of the product you're not using that you could take advantage of in a classroom. Um, another solution is to have train, training throughout the school year that, that's, that's ongoing rather than one time at the beginning of the year, teachers forget about it. Um, but this, this problem of, um, of 
products not being used at all or not being used uh, to their full extent uh, is something we're hearing about more and more in districts around the country. Can I jump in there, Sean? I'm curious what you were hearing in your room about the training issue, what challenges uh, districts had found with you know doing that effectively and making it work. On the cybersecurity front, it seems to be a big challenge, you know, how to actually get things, get the message to stick. Yeah, I mean, part of it is, is it one-time professional development? Is it uh, something more than that? Um, what's needed. One of the big challenges is trying to figure out where is the district in terms of its ed tech landscape right now. It's often um, difficult for a company to assess that in terms of uh, is this a district that has had big ed tech implementations in the past? Um, so they're not starting off at, at the ground floor in terms of uh, implementing a new product. Uh, or um, do they have a lot of experience, a lot of teachers who are comfortable working peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, coaching up their peers? Um, if you don't understand the ed tech landscape of a district going in, then, then really a company is much more likely to struggle and, and, and look back six months or nine months after they've implemented a product in a district and say, well, why aren't more people using it? Uh, well, you didn't understand what the challenges were in that district up front. And Ben, you've done a lot of reporting about teachers' use of technology over the years. What are some of the big frustrations you've heard and maybe have heard in the room today about yeah, uh, about the use of technology in schools? Some of the stuff is really basic, just uh, the time it takes to get students signed into different software programs. Um, you know, imagine a room full of 25 first graders and each one trying to type in a username and password. That can take half the class. And so companies have come in with solutions to try and make that easier, but you know, I think it's a constant game of cat and mouse just on the logistics of using the technology. Um, on the back end, there's often a challenge with uh, getting the information from the software program. So many, many of the, the software programs might say, you know, here's how Kevin is doing on reading uh, this particular skill on reading, and that's different from how Sean is doing on it. At some point, somebody has to take that information and make sense of it and make an instructional decision based on that. Should Kevin and Sean receive the same instruction tomorrow, or should they be getting different lessons? But that's time consuming. It's often very inefficient. Many teachers don't feel particularly comfortable and aren't well trained with the using that data or even accessing it on the back end. Um, and then the third big frustration, I think, is just distractions. You know, often the devices are in the classroom, um, and uh, it can be a challenge for teachers to make sure that students are using them in ways that are considered productive and educational and not, you know, playing Fortnite. So how much progress has been made on single sign-on? And that's sort of a question for both of you, um, both from the school side and, and, you know, in implementing it and also companies offering it. Uh, I think I don't have a hard number, but mm -hmm. anecdotally, I'd say it's definitely much more widespread, um, thanks in large part to companies like Clever, which have mm -hmm. gained a tremendous footprint in the market by offering these very kind of practical solutions to everyday problems. I think more districts are demanding it, and so companies, more companies are responding. Um, but I, I, th I think that it, it's sort of all over the map. It's, we still hear this is one of the biggest frustrations that the districts have. Uh, the time wasted uh, trying to sort through the sea of sign-ons and um, and just data ending up, ending up siloed um, in different departments. You have even data that could be related, uh, you know, academic performance data versus attendance data versus something else. Um, districts are trying to find ways of of making sure there's sort of a um, a more integrated approach to looking at this data that will help people across departments and ultimately help teachers and students. I would add that, that that issue of kind of information being siloed is part of the cybersecurity challenge as well because what you end up having in many cases is you know teachers and administrators sharing student files as Excel spreadsheets attached to an email which can often be very insecure or there's potential downsides when you put all that information in one place and try and make it easier to access that means it could be easier to access uh, for um, people who shouldn't have access to it as well so kind of either way you look at it there's kind of it, it's almost like a Rubik's cube, I think, for many schools trying to balance these issues of educational value versus ease of use versus cybersecurity and privacy. It's hard to get all of those pieces to fit together. Sean, you mentioned this difference or mismatch between uh, product support for product implementation and basic professional development. What, what did you mean by that? Sure. I mean, when we talk about professional development, when it pertains to ed tech, 
for the most part, we're talking about things like trying to build uh, teachers' capacity to use educational technology. Uh, their basic understanding of the tech tool that, that they're presented with, but more than that, trying to build um, their ability to apply that technology to student learning. So that that's sort of on the professional development side. Um, implementation is trickier because it, it, it's really dealing with the whole landscape of a district. You're trying to figure out, um, you know, do we have the tech infrastructure to s support this product? Uh, are our teachers prepared to use it? Um, are administrators and teachers talking to each other? Um, and, you know, what are we learning from the data in terms of how often uh, that technology is being used? So implementation support is more, more of a nuts and bolts issue, but a very important one in terms of trying to make sure that a product is being is doing what it's supposed to and that the district is sort of taking full advantage of it. I want to pivot back to uh, cybersecurity quickly. We have about a minute left. Uh, when there is a breach, you know, what is, what are, what's a good response? I think the biggest thing that uh, our experts advised in the room today was uh, transparency and immediacy. So uh, it's not something you are going to effectively hide. And so being upfront about it and being coordinated in the response and having it across multiple channels. So that might mean um, you know, making a public announcement, having a Q&A on your website. We've even saw examples of uh, you know, uh, pop-up messages for anyone who accesses the school district website to get information. And then being clear about what the steps to take and to remediate are. Often that involves kind of free, free credit monitoring for people who may be affected um, and kind of being clear about the steps that are being taken. Um, but I think the biggest lesson overall is that the, the best response is often prevention on the front end. And you know, with something like a ransomware attack where districts have been held for hostage by hackers for their information, what you see is that the, the threat that something like that uh, presents is often mitigated if you do things effectively up front like back up your data, have effective backup systems, segment your sensitive information for more public information, these kind of basic low-hanging fruit steps that many school districts are still struggling with, but can that really make responding on the back end much easier and more effective if you take care of the basics on the front end. Okay, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, audience, for joining us for a very lively online summit. I would encourage you to uh, read our Technology Counts report, which uh, has a lot of information about the sort of challenges we talked about here. I would also encourage you to read our EdTech Leader online-only special reports, which are available on edweek.org. And thank you very much.